Hello, and welcome to the live Nonprofit Pro webinar, Diversifying Your Fundraising to Infinity and Beyond, sponsored by Guide One. I'm Denise Gustafson. I'm the Editorial Director for NAPCO Media and Nonprofit Pro. I'm the host of today's event. Now, if 2020 taught us anything at all, it's not to put all our eggs, all of our eggs in one basket. Nonprofit organizations quickly realized that by relying on just one fundraising channel, in this case, in-person uh, fundraising, was a quick road to failure, which is why so many organizations had to pivot to digital strategies. Now, as nonprofits prepare for this post-pandemic phase, it's now more important than ever to make sure that they are diversifying their fundraising channels. This gives organizations extra financial security for when the next crisis hits, but it also diversifies their donor base as well. We know that every donor is built differently and they have different preferences in the way they give. By offering new and different ways for people to give, you are meeting them where they are and where they like to be. So today we're gonna to discuss a lot over this uh, one hour webinar. We're gonna talk about the different types of fundraising channels and which ones are a good fit for your nonprofit. We'll talk about how to integrate your fundraising channels to make it a more multi-channel approach. We'll also talk about why every nonprofit should include recurring giving, giving as part of its fundraising program. And also how to communicate with donors and supporters on different channels to keep them active and engaged. Now, before we dive into the topic, just a few housekeeping things uh, that we need to keep in mind. If you'll get, take a second at the bottom of your screen, I wanna port, point out the resources widget. It looks like an open book. Now, if you miss the tech tips video we were playing leading up to the webinar, you can always click this widget to access our tech tips PDF as well as other webinar resources. And additionally, feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. We'll have time at the end in order to uh, hold a Q&A session to address any of the questions that come up. And if something comes up during the presentation for a specific presenter, just let us know and just tell us that this question is for one of our presenters. So, and in talking about presenters, let's introduce who we have on the uh, webinar today. Our first um, speaker today is going to be Rachel Sorolnik. She's the principal for Raise Nonprofit Advisors. And then following her, we're gonna have Emily McAuliffe, Director of Direct Marketing at Smile Train, and also Mike Horowitz, who's the Director of Digital Fundraising at Smile Train. So I know we have a lot to get through today. So Rachel, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Denise. It's a pleasure to be here today with Nonprofit Pro, and thank you all of you fundraisers listening in that have joined for the webinar today. We've all heard stories of nonprofits who lost one key funder and found themselves scrambling, or maybe they were te technologically behind, and when COVID hit, they were up a creek. Maybe you've even worked or uh, currently work for such organizations. As Denise mentioned, as we emerge from this crisis, we understand that diversification is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And um, the, for the first half of the session today, we will look at diversification holistically, what can you be doing as an organization to be strengthening your fundraising and capitalizing on opportunities? And then I will hand it over to the folks at Smile Train who will talk um, a bit more um, technically about your fundraising channel. So I'm going to use a framework of who, what, when, where, why, and how. I'm taking a little bit of a poetic license to rearrange the order to make sense for the flow of our presentation. Well, let's get started. Who are your donors? So you have to get to know your donor base. Who are your donors? So to do this, um, we track constituents so you can know the types of donors given to your cause. And then you can use that data about these groups to inform your fundraising strategies. Oftentimes, organizations will have more than one lens through which they view their donors. One natural way to break down your donors is giving level. So under 100, donors under $1,000, major gift donors of 10,000, et cetera. In addition to this, for many organizations, they classify their donors into types of constituents. 
So a school, for example, would have parents, alumni, grandparents. Um, I've worked with a client that takes participants on experiential trips. So you have participants, non-participants, alumni, there's board members, former board members, subscribers, clients, client family members, you get it. Um, the point is to be tracking your donors in these ways so that you can then um, follow their performance. So do this one weird trick and watch your lower level donors grow. Um, for those of you that are waiting for me to say, drink this kombucha or do this yoga pose, I'm sorry, but we can meet up for kombucha or yoga another time. It's really about using data to inform your strategy. So once you tag and track your donors in your donor base, then you can use that data to see which constituents are giving generously as a group and which are not yet. And then you can um, understand where to give recognition and reinforce the um, current activities and where to devise new strategies. And when you're assessing giving levels, it's important to remember to think about lower donor, lower level donors, not just as their own isolated giving group, but as a, a pipeline of donors to matriculate to higher levels of giving. And some ways to identify those donors, the standout donors from among the group, are doing wealth screening. I recently screened about 2,500 alumni for an organization to see which of them kind of rose to the top and should be engaged for committee work and other uh, and early asks. And to listen to feedback from your lay leaders who are their peers and have an idea of uh, where there's potential for higher giving. Um, and then to think about where donor your donor loyalty lies. So um, where can you be asking for increases? And um, to do this, it's helpful to look at longitudinal data. So I do an analysis for my clients that looks at the past three years of giving and the last time a donor has increased their gift to determine who could be moved up to the next level. Those whose gifts have been flat for a few years, those who have made moderate increases, especially those who have made moderate increases on their own are um, great targets for increases. So that's the trick. Pay attention to this trend, to the trends and let the um, data drive your strategy. All right, up next, we did who, so what? What are the ways to diversify your fundraising? And specifically, I mean, what are the ways we can offer options about what, where, we are at, where we are asking our donors to give? To help us understand this question, I wanna describe what I call the nonprofit conundrum, which is on one hand, you have um, today's philanthropy is powered by donors who desire to give to make an impact. And they wanna see and feel that impact when they give. On the other hand, you have nonprofits who need general operating support. And even though it's very important, it doesn't often feel that exciting, like that exciting impact that a donor is looking for. So what do we ask donors to give to? We need to create win-wins, all right? So we need options. There's, we can find ways to tie donors giving to something that matters. So instead of asking everybody to participate in a generic annual fund, Think about creating giving options to fund specific programs and initiatives. But I want to be really clear. I'm not suggesting that you create new programs because um, I know that is um, often something that, that uh, leads us down the wrong rabbit hole. But um, rather to package and sell what you are already doing in a more attractive way. So for example, we work with an educational institution, a nonprofit that targeted specific needs and asked for funding for their liter literacy program, STEM program, instead of just their general campaign. Another nonprofit was expanding services to include online resources and was able to ask donors to direct to that effort specifically even though it was really budget relief for their cause. Um, so these special ca campaigns can range in magnitude. They could be kind of nested within an annual campaign, um, or they can be a standalone multi-year initiative. I think it's important to break out of the image that larger multi-year campaigns have to be tied to construction or to paying down a mortgage and a capital kind of structure. Um, special campaigns could be to launch a new program, initiative, or strategy, or for something as simple as an anniversary, an opportunity to celebrate. Where should we connect with our donors? So we have face-to-face, -face, direct mail, fundraising, uh, social media, oh my. Um, the second half of the webinar, as I mentioned, will delve into uh, more detail on fundraising channels, but um, I just want to talk to those smaller, org the smaller organizations out there who have little to no marketing support because you have to make tough decisions about how to spend your time. So um, you already know that I think of donors in terms of uh, giving groups. So when you think about channels, you need to think high and low. 
if you're a small fundraising shop, you need to be focusing on uh, time with your high level donors because you will see the ROI is gonna be totally worth your time. So um, traditionally that has happened in face-to-face -face meetings over COVID, that happened in many other ways, but making sure that you're spending that quality time with your donors. For your low to mid-level donors, direct marketing and social media are going to be your best venues for communication. So how do you know what are the right channels for you? Um, so first of all, we have to see if we can um, assess our the response and the level of engagement. And if you can tie that engagement back to dollars, that's even better, and or to new donors. Um, and you need to make sure that when you're doing this work, especially if you're a small nonprofit with limited resources, that you're not adding more work to your um, to your plate. So um, I like to think about the uh, and to utilize the rudimentary tools that are available for these purposes. So Google Analytics or Mailchimp metrics, or even just your social media match, uh, engagement, like. Uh, likes, fans, and comments are great ways for you to be able to see where you're getting the most impact. Um, and then second, work smarter and not harder. So think about where your constituency is. Where, if, if, For example, if you're working with a baby boomers and Gen X, so Facebook is probably a place that you want to be. If you're working with if your donors are millennials or you have a Gen, a Gen Z audience, then you need to have a presence on Instagram. And obviously, the content should be tweaked based on the channel. Although a lot of times, you know, you can you create something for one channel and then and then tweak it so that you're not duplicating your work. Um, so again, the constituent knowledge comes in really handy here, just knowing who your audience is. And then lastly, paying attention to what kinds of content get what kinds of response. So personally, I can tell you, I recently po posted a picture of me about to go to my first in-person meeting with a client in a, you know, a year and a half. And that got so many more likes than an article that I posted you know, a week or two before. So paying attention to that, you know, what gets people interested and excited. When is the right time to engage with these various constituencies in what kinds of campaigns and through what channels? I often hear that um, one of the biggest challenges that fundraisers face is prioritizing. You know, how can you do it all? Am I suggesting that you do it all and through what channels? Um, and, and how is it even possible to do it all? So first, no, I'm not asking for you to do it all. Um, you have limited time and resources. And like I said, you need to be thinking about the ROI. Um, using the data measurement tools that we mentioned. But how do you do as much as you can? This is where a development plan becomes really important. And the plan should weave these various components together in a manageable and balanced way and create a cadence for your fundraising year. So for example, a major gifts campaign or event to start the year off and um, close major gifts early on in the campaign year, and then completing the year with a virtual a campaign or crowdfunding campaign with scheduled communications and solicitations for mid-sized gifts and large gifts that are still open uh, throughout the remainder, throughout the middle of the year. How can you motivate your donors to give? How do you actually get people to give? Because human nature is to procrastinate. If you're like me, then you give a lot of donations on December 31st and you call your accountant on April 10th. And um, how do we motivate people to actually do so? There are a lot of tools out there that are helpful in closing gifts and getting people to respond to your call to action. And those include, I listed some of them on the slides, crowdfunding, virtual events, monthly giving, and donor listing. So when you think about crowdfunding, I'm talking about a often a, a time-bound campaign, oftentimes with a matching component that gets people to say, I've got to do this now to help this or to help this organization reach its goal. Um, virtual events, we've been doing a lot of these over COVID with our clients. So instead of having a dinner, they have a virtual dinner and they have a fundraising page that's up for the four to six weeks in advance of the event with a progress bar, um, with you know a, a, um, a tribute page or kind of a, an online journal. So people get that recognition and people kind of feel like they're giving to a structured campaign and um that's a great way to kind of and and that can be something that can also be tied back as we think about moving past covid um that can be integrated as into your general fundraising if you're doing a live events as just as easily 
Um, then let's talk about monthly giving, or as I like to say, interval giving. We could be talking about monthly giving for an annual campaign or multi-year gifts for um, a, a, a special campaign. Um, and that allows you time to steward, not only solicit, and allows those donors and also frees up time for work with other audiences um, and to just do other, you know, all of the other items on your plate. So um, this is a, a great a great way to try to um, kind of streamline your work. Um, and then um, listings, this is kind of, you know, an oldie but a goodie. Um, everybody likes to be included on a list of generous people and it's a good tool to leverage and utilize in um, often in, in kind of where people run in the same circles and local community institutions. Um, and with all of these great tools, we want to make sure that donors still understand, we want to train our donors that it is their annual gift that is what enables your nonprofit to fulfill its mission. So um, as much as these are great tools, we want to be training people that this is not a one-off crowdfunding event that you're giving to um, or a special campaign that is happening once in a while, but you're giving to our mission and we rely on your money um, and your generosity year after year to be able to continue doing our important work. Um, so reinforcing that expectation through your messaging and your marketing, through your conversations and with um, with donors and the uh, correspondence you send to them, thank you notes, et cetera. All right, why? So the obvious why is why um, diversify your fundraising? And the obvious answer is to make your organization stronger and more sustainable, which is what we started with. However, the more fundamental question is why does your mission matter? Know why you are asking them for their support? Often we talk about the components that we've discussed together today. How will they give? Where will they give? When will they give? But why should they give is really a question that underpins everything and is worth spending real time on. Once that is clear, it'll motivate you to pursue these various functions with new enthusiasm and motivate your donors, whoever they are and however they're giving, to feel inspired, engaged, and fulfilled by their participation in your organization's important work. So um, thank you so much again for uh, listening today. I'd love to connect. You can sign up for my newsletter, reach out via email, which you see on the screen here, or follow us on Facebook. And I'm going to turn the presentation over now to the folks at Smile Train. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily McAuliffe, and Mike Horowitz and I will be talking about fundraising at Smile Train. Uh, Smile Train is an international cleft lip and palate charity. Um, some stats about us. We have supported over one and a half million cleft surgeries in over 90 countries um, since 1999 when we were founded. Um, a little bit about our fundraising, uh, the history of our fundraising and our direct marketing here. Um, we started with a pretty robust direct mail program. Um, so direct mail has historically generated the majority of our revenue here at Smile Train. Um, but since consumer behavior is changing, people are becoming more tech savvy, paper postage costs are increasing. I don't know if anyone has been following the, the recent USPS postage increases. Um, people are becoming more and more immune to mail. It's more and more difficult to, to, to generate the funds via mail. We have made um, a conscious effort in recent years to diversify our fundraising portfolio. Um, in addition, tying it into the, the changes in, in lifestyle due to COVID, you know, organizations that were heavily reliant on face-to-face -face canvassing and other in-person events couldn't be doing those types of fundraising um, either. So um, a couple of areas we have been investing in recent years um, is digital and DRTV. So we'll be talking about those two areas today. Um, I will kick it off to Mike to talk about digital fundraising, and then I'll loop back around to talk about DRTV in our sustainer program. Thanks, Em. Hey, everybody. This is Mike from Smile Train. I'm the director of digital fundraising, and I'm going to touch on a little bit of the performance we've been seeing in the digital space um, where we're focusing our investments and give you guys a couple of tips and best practices to help you grow your digital um, so we can start here with, this is our cash flow over the past four years in digital. Um, so all of our paid media as well as email, and this is, this is very good news. Um, you'll see 2021 has a significant lift over last year. 
Um, and these are these are large numbers. So we're really happy with the way um, digital has been going for us. Um, and you know, while M has said that we've been attempting to diversify uh, our portfolio, we for a couple of years, as you can see, we struggled scaling digital. Um, and in the past year or two, we, we found a couple of things that have worked really well for us. Um, and I'm going to touch on them for you guys. So the first one is Facebook. Everybody's familiar with this platform. Um, this is a huge acquisition source for us um, and retention to a lesser degree. A um, couple of reasons why we chose to focus on this channel so heavily. The first is its data. So it's a highly differentiated source of data, which is what digital advertising is all about. It's who has the best data. Um, and Facebook arguably does have that um, the best data available. Um, it's all first party, so collected by them. It's nothing is inferred or modeled. So it's very tight and reliable data. Generally, when you're demo targeting on Facebook by age, it's correct because people have to input their age when they sign up. Um, it's not inferred like some other platforms where they will do things um, like if you view these types of sites, we're going to assume you're of this age. Um, that's what puts Facebook's data a little bit above other platforms. Their scale, obviously huge. You know, probably half the world is on Facebook, so more donors than anybody could ever acquire are out there. Um, the creative formats, which in my view is really the crux of all digital acquisition and just digital advertising in general. Facebook has a lot of formats available for testing, and most of them are pretty easy to implement. Um, and you can get by without having a creative agency or any designers, really. You can work with some pretty, um, you know, raw assets. And the UI is, is quite simple. Um, now we have an agency who runs it for us, but in the past I've done it. Um, there are plenty of free and cheap courses online and, you know, websites you can read. Um, but it's, it's not too difficult to get going on the platform yourself. And listed out here a couple of best practices and quick wins you guys could consider if you're not on Facebook or perhaps you're considering it. First thing is making sure you have the Facebook pixel on your site. Um, this is just a piece of code that your um, web team should be able to implement pretty easily. It can be hard coded. If you use a tag management system like GTM, you can also use that. Um, and what this will do is communicate data back to Facebook and allow the algorithm to optimize better. So if you're running ads on Facebook, this is an absolute must. Um, if you're running ads without this, you should pause and put this on your site and then get going again. Um, secondly is testing lots of creative. Um, just for context, Smile Train has probably tested over 100 different images and videos the past 12 months on Facebook. We're constantly rolling new assets in. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's an investment in time, but it's essential to your success on the platform. And a couple of tips about it. You want to make sure that it's going to, quote, stop the scroll. I think we're all aware with the, the mechanism of the news feed. People are, are scrolling down and they're seeing their friends' wedding photos and ads from everybody in the world. So you need to make sure you have something that is appealing and is going to get their attention enough to make them stop. And if you're running video, I'd encourage you to be critical of your thumbnail so you can select what the first image will be. Um, so perhaps your video doesn't start off with the best image, but in the middle, there's a very eye-catching image or it's very colorful. I'd suggest thinking about making that your uh, thumbnail for the video. Some things about writing copy. A mistake that we made was assuming that people knew what we do and we would talk to prospective donors with um, what I call brand speak, and we would talk to generally, and we would um, assume they were ready to donate. We knew why we were so important because we knew it. Um, that's not the case. People are exposed to thousands of ads a day, and generally no one cares what advertisers have to say. So you need to really make it clear to people what you're about and why they should care about it. And another mistake that we made was not focusing enough on copywriting and enough editing. We often would come up with something we thought was pretty good and, and we would roll with it and it usually wouldn't perform terrifically well. And as of late, we spend a lot more time writing 10, 15, 20 different versions and getting a lot of different eyes on them and making sure it's be the best copy available. A little bit about audiences. So I would suggest that you start with your best, most qualified audiences first. 
which would be your CRM audiences. So can you re-engage your existing donors, your best donors, people who are high value, people who are um, sustainers, groups like that. And then you can also build lookalikes off of those um, you know, great donors of yours and find audiences that are similar. And then from there, you want to move out to more general audiences, things like interest, you know, um, people who are interested in gardening, things like that. That would be the bottom, the most general. Um, and lastly, you want to make sure you have the pixel on your site. You want to make sure that you're tracking donations properly and everything is flowing into your database as well as Facebook for optimization purposes. I'd also encourage you to look at custom events. So there are other things you can track on your website that are um, relevant and important for acquisition purposes. For example, at cart. So you want to target people who are visiting your landing page as a retargeting audience. You want to target people who've donated as a converter audience. You also want to make sure you're bumping people who started the process. Um, that's a highly qualified audience that is close to donating. So you want to make sure that you're bumping them separately, having creative speaks directly to them, and you're helping um, push them over the edge because if they're getting to your form and starting it, they're pretty close to converting. And I'm going to show you a bit of creative that we've that we've run, um, and it's a little our creative for Facebook is a little bit templatized, and I'll show you the video and kind of explain how, how we do that. Even in the midst of the coronavirus crisis, our local doctors performed thousands of surgeries last month. We still need you with us. His life can't wait. Save a life with the gift of cleft treatment. Donate to Smile Train today. So I couldn't see that, but I'm assuming it worked well for everyone. Um, and things to note about that video that we generally see work really well are the animated text. So you want to make sure that you're running creative that is going to stop the scroll, as I mentioned, and what stops the scroll generally is movement. So um, having the copy appearing graphically and at, at different speeds is, is going to be helpful for that. You want to be very clear about what your message is and what you're asking of people and why you need their support, and you want to end with a strong CTA. Um, and we've seen the asset work really well, and once you find one that works well, um, assuming you have some B-roll or, you know, stock photography, you can roll in, in our case, different children and different patients into one creative version and give it um, extended legs. We've seen a lot of success with that method. Also, imagery, you don't need to run video if running video is not feasible due to um, cost or bandwidth or, or time. We also see images work well often. Um, here you'll see two examples of ones we've seen work very well in the past few months. Um, and you could do something as simple as adding a border to an image like we see on the right or on the left. We've also added a small donate today button. So little things like that will make your creative stick out. And Facebook also rewards additional creatives. So it, it wants you to run a lot of creative to keep the experience fresh for users. So a little trick you can do is you can run an image without a border and then you can duplicate it and then add a border. Um, that'll give you some additional reach and probably increase your performance there um, without needing to do a ton of development work. Um, moving on to another channel of ours we see a lot of success with, and I would um, encourage all organizations who are not live in paid search to, to look at it closely. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar, down at the bottom, you'll, you'll see an example. This is when people are on Google or Bing or any other search platform and they're searching for your brand or donate to charity, things like that, you want to make sure that you're showing up at the top. And when people search for you, they're seeing the message you want them to see and they're going to the place you want them to go uh, because they are hand raisers. These people who are, in the case of your brand terms, someone searching for small trade, for example, they're highly interested in your cause. So you want to make sure that you're reaching them and you are showing the message you want because if you don't, you can bet that other organizations are bidding on your terms. And if you don't do that, another top, and that person could go to that other charity's website and you'll lose that donation. Um, or they could click on a organic search listing, which you have less control over, and they may go to um, a page that's maybe not as relevant. And it's also very easily testable in terms of copy and landing pages. So. 
I'd encourage everyone to do a bit of research on paid search if you're not super familiar with it. Um, it worked very, very well for us for uh, acquisition. Um, moving on to other channels that are looking forward, like future channels for us that we're hoping to grow is email. We've been running email for a very long time and have had um, ebbs and flows in performance over the past year. We've seen it do very, very well. And um, in part due to the creative focus that we have been applying in Facebook, we're moving that into email as well, as well as focusing on a couple of higher level uh, topics like increasing marketing automation. So when a new donor comes on file, we want to make sure that we have a series set up that maybe goes over the course of a week or two that is thanking them for their gift, introducing them to the cause and um, serving them relevant calls to action and welcoming them into what we do. Um, lap series, so 12 months, whatever happens to be, serving them a series, um, you know, inquiring about what's happened or sharing them relevant content, whatever you want it to be to hopefully get them re-engaged and giving again. Um, we're looking into trigger emails based on content on our site. So for example, if someone's on our site and they read a story about the Philippines, um, they could receive an automated email with um, follow-up content about that country. Increases in personalization is something we're also focusing on and have brought on a vendor to help us with. And the end goal is to power email content based on actions users are taking instead of batching emails to thousands of people and assuming everybody wants to see the same thing. Um, for example, a certain story on our site, we can have our email template set up with a dynamic content block that would be seeking a donation. And based on where they viewed on their site, they would get a photo from that region versus a more uh, generic region. And again, this is to give everybody an individualized, personalized experience, um, which will hopefully increase conversion and retention. Here's an example of what one of these, um, up top, you'll see a, uh, a GIF that could be based on one of your top performing videos. The second module, did you forget to complete your donation? For users who recently abandoned their cart, we could have a dynamic section here, encouraging them to finish their gift. Um, down below that, we can dynamically insert new blog posts from our site. Um, and below that, perhaps a live social feed. And this is in part to give them a more personalized experience, but also will automate the email development process for you. So in the case of the blog post, you don't need to keep changing that content and creating new imagery. Um, you can have a piece of code in there that'll pull in the most recent content for you. So it'll, it'll save time on your end as well. And in, in addition to email for acquisition, we're also looking to um, diversify not only to digital, but within the digital space to other channels in digital, because right now we're, we're quite heavy in Facebook and it works very well, but it could stop working well tomorrow. And um, with the recent, privacy changes with iOS that have just happened and the other ones that we don't know about yet. Um, digital is a constantly in flux channel. So even if you have something working, you always need to be looking to the next thing. And for us, that's YouTube, uh, in part because of the scale, a few billion people on YouTube. I think everyone is, is aware of that platform. Um, it's a little bit less cluttered than Facebook. So Facebook has the news feed where you're competing with other content and other ads. That's less so on YouTube. It's generally in the form of, um, pre-roll or mid-roll where someone's watching a video and they're getting served one ad in their experience. Um, in addition to the less part of the experience is it's owned by Google. So it's part of their tech stack, which allows for, for a bit of cross-channel work. So if you spend a certain amount on YouTube, you can run studies that will um, answer the question, do users search my brand more after doing a YouTube ad? Because um, YouTube could not perform amazingly well for direct click donations, but um, similar to TV, exposing a relevant audience to your ad has an effect, and you may see an increase in people searching for your brand, which is a little bit further down uh, the funnel, so you can look at metrics like that. Another one is you can, um, people who viewed your ad, you can target them across Google's network, whether that's with display ads, showing them perhaps an ad with the same child in the video they saw, and on paid search, you can bucket them into a group and serve them copy that maybe speaks to the video that they saw. And down here at the bottom, I want to just call out this note because it just happened to us a few weeks ago. So I wanted to spare somebody this, uh, this issue. Um, 
probably can't just reuse your Facebook videos for YouTube. The ad I played before had a voiceover because we just added it. Um, but the original version on Facebook did not have a voiceover because Facebook is a uh, sound off platform. Um, and YouTube is a sound on platform. So you want to make sure you're taking advantage of that. If you're running or if you're hoping to run ads you've created for Facebook, make sure they have audio, make sure they have a voiceover because people will have sound on on YouTube. And just want to make sure you're factoring in those costs and development time because it, it could cost a few bucks to a, uh, a designer to make those changes. And reverse rate optimization. So this is the practice of increasing the percentage of users who perform a desired action on a website. In our case, this is getting more people to donate who visit our website. Um, you need to make sure that you're working from both ends. You can have the best creative in the world, the best targeting in the world, but if people visit your site and it's slow, it's ugly, it has too many fields, they're not going to donate. So you need to make sure that as much focus as you're putting on your investment, you're putting an equal amount of focus on your website. It's incredibly important. Um, and one of the best places to start is A-B testing. We've seen a lot of success, double-digit percentage increases in conversion rate by doing simple tests, like testing header images, um, testing body copy on the page, um, different gift arrays, reversing the order, um, removing elements not critical to someone donating. We, um, you know, we removed some buttons that weren't needed for someone to donate, and we saw an increase in conversion because we were reducing friction. We're making the process easier for someone to make a gift, and that's what you want to do to make it as easy as possible. You don't want to ask for as much as possible. You want to ask for as little as possible just to get them to donate, and then later you can follow up. For example, if you don't need someone's mail address to get them to donate on your site, you shouldn't ask for it. You can cut down you know, five fields and just have perhaps their name and zip and email. And then later, you can send them an email and uh, explain the benefits of, of why they should give you their address. And you can obtain it later, or you may not even need it, and then you don't need to do that at all. Um, and this will be my last up before I pass it to M. And I wanted to quickly touch on some cross-channel integration that we've recently done between direct mail and Facebook. Um, this was for our Premier Circle, which is our high-value donor group. And on the left, you'll see um, a little piece of what the DM kit looked like. And it was much bigger than this. It was many pages with a ton of copy and, and images. Um, and we thought it would be a good test to take this group and target them on Facebook with uh, similar creative and see if that would increase conversion in DM or just get a few more people through the Facebook ad. And the image on the right is our attempt at um, you know, making that very large DM kit a Facebook ad. And I think we did a pretty good job. It, it looks good and gets across the main message, which in this case was donate $1,000 and you'll have a, a plaque in one of our partner hospitals. Um, so a, a few notes on the process here. You want to make sure you're streamlining your creative to fit in the Facebook environment and really pulling out what is the most essential, memorable piece of your kit and focusing your Facebook creative on that. Um, using Facebook's custom audience tool to import your audience. So from your DM agency or your own database, you should be able to pull who is receiving DM kit. And I would encourage you to use as much data as you can. Um, name, email, phone number, address, pretty much whatever you have. Facebook accepts more than that. Um, this will increase your match rate and allow you to reach more people on Facebook. And lastly, when you're selecting the campaign to run a test like this with, I would encourage you to look at the broadest, largest campaign because platforms like Facebook and most digital platforms um, want the largest audience possible to help you find your donors. So I would suggest looking at the broadest campaign possible. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to M, who is going to cover a bit of uh, RTV and sustainable how we're doing. Everybody. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, as Mike said, I'll be talking about um, our direct response television program at Smile Train, which is another um, COVID safe uh, investment that we've been increasing in the past couple um, of years. So we are primarily in doing short form spots, which is what you think probably what you think of when you think of a direct response television ad, one, two, three minute TV spot. We tested into um, a COVID acknowledging spot in 2020. It wasn't, it's not super COVID heavy, um, but just sort of peppers in some language to acknowledge the pandemic. For example, every three minutes, a child is born with a cleft, even during a pandemic, our lives will eventually 
normal, but they might may continue to be isolated. Um, things like that, just to sort of frame our our work in context of of the larger um, situation affecting the world. Um, so our spots, uh, the ask is a twenty-one dollar a month sustainer ask. The call to action is to call or go online. Um, we have a unique toll-free number per combination of um, creative ne um, network and length. Um, so we know exactly what they saw if they call, if they call, um, or they can go to our microsite, which is pretty much just a, a dedicated landing page with tracking. So we know that they came on through TV if they came to that specific landing page. Um, additionally, you might, you know, as you might expect, some people might not go to that microsite or might not call, they'll just search for us. And if they do, our agency has an attribution model where they are constantly gathering our baseline web traffic and when they see spike above baseline in conjunction with the airing of a spot, they can sort of infer that a degree to those, a degree um, of those spikes were, uh, can be attributed to TV. Um, that's a little bit about our tracking. Um, additionally, we have been testing Hispanic DRTV, which is sort of up and coming. Um, we translated our, our um, control spot with a Spanish speaking voiceover. Um, an airing on Spanish-speaking stations, uh, TV stations, and we have an in-language donation form, just our standard donation form that we translated into Spanish and have a Spanish-speaking call center to field calls. Um, so uh, a couple other related mediums um, to test, CTV or over the top, this is your Hulu's new Netflix's, which is sort of um, up and coming, um, long form ads, which is a 30-minute a, a segment um, you might have see, you might see those from time to time, um, and also also podcast ads, um, which is sort of up and coming, pretty pretty unsaturated at the moment. Uh, next, some pros and cons to DRTV. Advantages: scale. If it works for you, you can spend tens of millions of dollars. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen the St. Dudes and the Shriners; they're on all the time. They have huge scale. Uh, brand awareness, even if someone isn't donating to you, you're getting eyeballs on your brand. Um, also, DRTV donors tend to be pretty um, good quality donors. They proactively are raising their hand and calling and going online versus some other um, more passive conversion that we see in offline channels, such as calling via telemarketing or going up with someone in face-to-face -face canvassing on the street. So these people are... Um, proactively contacting you to donate. They tend to be good quality and have a high long-term value. Um, they tend, our, our DR, DRTV donors tend to, um, you know, give give second gifts um, more so than, than some other channels. Some considerations to keep in mind, um, cost of entry can be, can be a barrier. Um, the cost to produce a film spot can be expensive, especially if you don't have existing footage and you need to do a film trip. Um, to put together the spot, and also the cost of media can be really expensive. Um, so it, you know, it is a barrier to entry. Um, limited testing capacity. What I mean by this is, um, to to call, you need a um, a unique toll free number per creative length and station in order to track. So it can get if you're testing too many creative versions of too many stations, it can get really kind of clunky and unwieldy. Um, it's not as easy to test multiple creatives as it is in digital, as Mike was explaining. Um, some creative and media buying best practices. Um, the longer the spot, the more time you have to tell your story and make a connection, but that media is gonna be more expensive. So you have to kind of see how that ROI shakes out. Um, you know, you wanna really pull at the heartstrings. You know, one might think, oh, I'm gonna tell the story of all the wonderful things that Smile Train has done. And you do wanna show your success stories, but um, what's really gonna make that donor call or go online is gonna is, is to show an unresolved need. Um, they still need me. There's still kids out there that need um, cleft surgery. Um, show the need as still out there, still unresolved. Show patient stories. Um, let the donor connect with a patient. Um, also showing, having the spot or the, the communication be donor centric, the donor's the hero. You can help a child like Maria. We need you um, rather than, you know, the organization is the hero. 
Um, some meaty buying best practices. Um, our target demographic tends to be an older female demographic, so we are airing on stations that tend to draw that audience. Um, and we're constantly monitoring and shifting our spend based on uh, the cost per donor metric. Um, also, in terms of time frame, Q1 and Q4 tend to do well on the holidays, the new year, um, tend to tend to do well kind of across the board. So as I mentioned, our DRTV ads are a sustainer ask. We're asking for $21 a month, our frequent smiler program. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of a sustainer program. Um, a sustainer program is, is huge. We're constantly trying to, to grow our program. It's stable, predictable income. You know, within a few percentage points, you can sort of expect that revenue to come in every month. Great for forecasting. Um, Someone's giving to every month, they're probably pretty passionate about your cause. They're probably pretty engaged donors. They might post on social about you. They might hold a fundraiser. They might tell your, their friends about you. Good donors to have in your file. Um, you know, you might have heard the saying, it's cheaper to maintain a customer than to acquire a new one. It's cheaper to retain a sustainer than it is to try to get a one-time donor to give again. You don't have to mail them as much. Um, keep them cultivated. Steward them a little bit. Um, but it's... It, they're, they're good to have around. Um, so as we've talked about today, the main channels for sustainer acquisition of Mile Train are DRTV and digital. We were um, working and we were, in, we were doing a face-to-face -face canvassing program um, prior to COVID, but, but haven't, haven't relaunched that yet. Um, some tips for converting and maintaining your sustainers. Um, we like to frame our Frequent Smiler program as sort of an exclusive community. We have our um, Frequent Smiler logo that's on this slide that appears in all of our Frequent Smiler communications. So they feel that brand consistency. They feel a part of this community. We send them an exclusive newsletter, um, make them feel special. Um, you want to clearly out, outline the ongoing need, what their monthly donation will continue to do. Um, this is particularly important in our line of work because not only do we provide cleft surgery, um, but we provide um, other essential comprehensive cleft care services, such as speech therapy, nutritional support, orthodontics, and things like that, which are ongoing for a patient. Um, so that's a story we want to continue to tell our donors that they're not just supporting one surgery, they're supporting the whole patient over a long period of time. Um, so we want to continue to, to, to tell that story that we're able to, to, to help children with their ongoing support. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We want to continue to thank our donors for, for their generous support and steward them and cultivate them. Um, additionally, another really important component of a successful sustainer program is a frequent multi-channel lapse through capture strategy. So what I mean by this is um, when a, a monthly donor's payment doesn't go through, their credit card might have expired, um, you want to try to recapture them as soon as you can, however you can email, mail, phone, text, um, the sooner the better um, to, get them, to get them back on your file. Um, so those are a few sort of best practices um, for, for DRTV and a sustainer program, which are a big part of our, our portfolio these days. Um, so thank you so much for, for listening um, about our work here at Smile Train. And I think I will pass it over to Denise for some Q&A. Thank you, Emily. And actually, Mike and Rachel, thank you as well. We covered a lot of really, really good information uh, in today's webinar. So, And we've gotten a number of different questions that have come in. So actually, Rachel, the first question I'm going to lob over is going to be to you. Um, a lot of... Uh, a lot of nonprofits are, you know, they might be hanging on by a string. You know, maybe they have a very reduced budget. So how can you attract donors when you maybe have limited funds or even limited people? Yeah, that is um, a very good question and one that I hear a lot. So we spoke um, earlier on about ROI, return on investment, and um, I, I learned something from a graduate school teacher many years ago that I think was wise advice. And I try to think about when I'm advising a nonprofits and I, I share this with them, which is 
um, being strategic is as much about what you're not doing as what you are doing. So if you see that a strategy isn't bearing fruit, then drop it. And I think that COVID kind of gave us the freedom to do this with a lot of um, you know labor intensive events that we were able to just you know scratch from the calendar and reimagine and reinvent. So I think um, always being open to reimagining and thinking how we could do this smarter and not being afraid to uh, cast something aside that isn't really getting the results that you'd like to see. All right, great. Thank you, Emily. Does anybody else have anything they want to add to um, to that at this point? Yeah, okay, awesome. So Mike, I'm gonna actually, the next question that we got in is going to be for you. So a number of questions came in talking about email campaigns specifically. Now, I know there's a number of different email programs that can be used. Would you be willing to chat a little bit about what program you're using and then how do you avoid overlapping um, email communications when you're segmenting your donors? Yeah, so we use ActiveCampaign. Um, and in the past, we used Salesforce Marketing Cloud, which we found to be a little um, not intuitive, to say the least. ActiveCampaign is a little easier to use. Um, and as far as avoiding overlap, I think a little bit of overlap is unavoidable. It kind of depends on the types of emails you're sending, if you have autoresponders going out. Um, but generally, our segments are built on um, engagement. So we'll tier people out based on recency, on how recent they opened or engaged an email, where that's a month, two months, three months, four months, and, and kind of back down um, for things that are maybe related to what we call a journey of smiles, which is a donor trip out to the field. That would be more loyalty-based. So people who've been on file for a long time, people have given um, a certain amount. Um, that group probably would receive an email like that, more so than um, having it based on email engagement. And overlap, we put things in place, uh, auto suppressions, so making sure people are not receiving two emails in one day, um, but people may fall into different groups. So someone may get our newsletter, and then they may um, you know, make a donation, they're going to get an auto responder. So I think um, a little bit of it is inevitable, as long as it's relevant content to what they're doing, um, we don't see a huge issue with it. All right, awesome. Thanks, Mike, very much. Actually, Emily, the next one is going to be talking to, uh, is going to be in your court. Um, how do you keep donors engaged? I mean, there's a lot of different channels we use, but what's the best way that you've been finding to keep donors engaged? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the sort of the mass marketing um, sphere, you know, in our in our mass communication channels, email, mail, um, thanking them, continuing to tell them what their gifts have been able to do, um, and then what the you know the ongoing need is, um, give, providing updates of um, different things we're in, initiatives we're doing or new programs we might have launched in a new region, for example, um, keeping them updated on our work thanking them for what they have done thus far and continuing to display the, the continuing need. Okay, great. Um, Rachel, did you have anything you wanted to add with this question as well? Sure. Um, so um, Emily spoke a little bit about from a kind of direct marketing approach. I would say when you're talking to individual donors and you want to be keeping them engaged from one year to the next, um, I think I think a good thing to do is to think about opportunities for engagement. So um, do, are you able to take them on site visits like the smile train teams um, that smile train team said, or what other opportunities for engagement, unique opportunities can your organization provide? Provide. And I, people generally support, they like to support what they help to create. So if you can share your plans, share collateral with them, ask them to join committees. Um, and oftentimes I find people are more willing to say yes if they know it's going to be a finite engagement that's like uh, has, a, has defined parameters. So uh, to give them those opportunities. And also when you ask people to um, participate in those kinds of opportunities, they're more likely to be. Um, to open doors for you and to be a partner in solicitations when there's a reason that they're asking. Um, and the last thing I would say is when you're meeting with individual donors, 
be a really good active listener and think about what they're saying and how you can then apply that to their trajectory with the organization, the cultivation path that you're going to take them on. So I think a lot about open-ended questions like, what are your impressions of our organization? Or what has been, you know, you're, you've been a generous donor, you know, what has inspired you to give to our cause and why do you keep giving to us? And just asking those kinds of questions and listening. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Sure. Mike, another question for you um, was, I know um, Smile Train uses a lot of Facebook, as you brought out, and email. But are there other channels, maybe Instagram, TikTok, that might help to address younger audiences? Mm -hmm. Is that anything that you've tried or have you had any success with some other platforms as well? So we, we definitely do see some success um, on Instagram for acquisition. Um, it's not a huge part of what we do, but our organic social team definitely focuses on that platform. Um, TikTok, not so much yet. Our demos are a little older for TikTok, um, but it's probably something we should consider soon. And I think for people who are looking at these more emerging social channels, I think it's essential that you're not simply repurposing what you're doing on Facebook and hoping that it works, especially on TikTok. Um, that's probably not going to go well. Um, and just in general, with things like that, making sure that you're providing value to people who are on it. People are on TikTok because it's fun. Um, they're not on it to be talked at by companies. So you need to make sure that when you're putting content out there, it's not um, completely self-serving. You want it to be a little bit self-serving, um, but people viewing it want to be entertained or have some type of value from it. Um, and that's an easy one to miss for a lot of people. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Rachel, another question came in for you. Um, talking about some recommendations for how to balance your fundraising efforts so that you're not asking for too much too often. Because I know that can, you know, how often is too often? How often is not enough? So are there any ways to balance some of those when you're talking to your donors? Definitely. So uh, people don't like to be treated like ATM machines. You go to them for their gift and then you leave and don't come back till you ask for the next gift. So I think the most important thing we can do is communicate with our donors. Um, if it's a if it's a major gift donor, that means through a personal relationship. If it's a uh, lower level donor, then that means through direct marketing and online marketing like we've been talking about. Um, and I think it's just really important to um, to just be thinking about and, and and conditioning donors that you will be asking for their gifts on an annual basis, even if they're giving monthly, they're giving that's kind of just being processed from their um, their credit card on a monthly basis, but that you're filling the year with other things that then the things other than the ask and teach them about the importance of, that, that they're they're giving annually allows you to plan your budget and be able to uh, help that many more people um, of course planning the budget is not the first thing you should say to them when you're talking about the impact but when you're in a conversation you have the opportunity kind of to educate about the importance of their gift okay awesome thank you now this one i think is going to be a combination of emily and mike this question um it's kind of talking about um youtube and specifically um drtv if you're using more youtube are you going to use less drtv or would you end up using more i'm not sure which of you could talk to a little bit about that because i mean they're both video platforms um so you're providing video you know any any thoughts about that yeah, I could chime in there for a second. I mean, the answer is we don't know. Um, I think we'll scale up what is working best for us. And as of now, we're not sure what that is. I don't know that we necessarily would decrease our DRTV investment by scaling up Facebook, um, or sorry, by scaling up YouTube, um, but it's possible. That's, sorry for that non-answer. Um, that's kind of the best answer I have. That's okay. Emily, do you have anything to add? Um, not really. Yeah, kind of just what Mike said, yeah. Okay, good. Now, I guess my other question is uh, for Rachel that came in is talking about differentiating nonprofits. There's a lot of distractions in the market, whether it's online, whether it's, you know, in the mail, in your mailbox. How, what are some of the most effective calls to action that you've seen? So I think that um, in Stercredit Marketplace, the, to stand out, one thing you can do is to really try to personalize 
Um, so when it comes to, again, talking to, to individual donors to remember things like their birthdays, you know, if their kid have a kid going off to college or someone had a new baby to make note of those and to personalize your communication with them, that the organization is there for them and is part of their life and cares about them. Um, and on a broader scale, I think applying those same ideas. So like when you're able to personalize emails, make emails look personalized, even if you're not really personalizing them, when I get an email that says, Dear Rachel, and then it's a mass marketing email. I understand that, but it still has a different effect than just like here's content. So um, I think trying to make the effort to personalize will really help your organization stand out. Okay, great. Well, uh, Rachel, Emily, Mike, thank you so much for your time today. We are right up on our hour. So um, on behalf of Nonprofit Pro and Guide One, I want to thank you for attending today's webinar. Be sure to check out our webinar page to get information on all of our archived and upcoming webinars as well. Now, if you have a minute, uh, there's going to be a brief feedback survey that will appear um, just after this concludes. If you could fill out that quick survey, we'd be very grateful. It'll help to influence the webinars that we bring you in the future. So I hope to see you again at our next Nonprofit Pro webinar. Thanks.